I knew that it was going to be the most important weekend of my life. And actually, just before getting in the car for the race, my manager, he didn't tell me good luck. He didn't say, you know, have fun. He was like, these next two hours are the most important two hours of your life. And I was like, thanks a lot. <laughs> thanks for that. I did not yes. need you to tell me that. Welcome everybody to F1 Beyond the Grid. I am delighted to say that this week's guest is Ollie Behrman. Ollie, great to have you on the show. How are you? Good, very good. It's a pleasure. Um, this is actually one of two podcasts that I've actually ever listened to. Um, and I've been on the first one, the high performance one, and now it's, uh, it's this one. So yeah, I, I like to listen to these ones to see the inside of some of the drivers and now I'm one of the drivers, so it's funny <laughs> you how things are change. are one of the drivers, and uh, no bad driver either. What, what a year you've had. Two races, two different teams, two points finishes in Formula One. Start as you mean to go on. Yeah, I've got a long point streak, even if it's just in, in two races. But um, no, it's, it's been a bit of a crazy year in terms of F1 appearances. Um, of course, going into the year as a reserve driver for any team, you know that there's an opportunity at some point to race, but usually it's very, very rare. Um, and, and the fact that I've been able to do two races this year with two different teams, it's been uh, it's been quite unexpected. Um, but I feel like I've managed to, you know, take both of those opportunities with, with both hands and make the most of them. You absolutely have. But how difficult has it been for you to deal with everything that's been thrown at you this year? It's definitely been a busy year. Um, you know, I've been I've been focusing on F2, but with everything that's happened, especially after Jeddah, um, it, it's just been a whirlwind. Um, and, you know, all of my F1 outings and in, in FP1s, the announcement in Silverstone, there's been a lot going on this year, um, but all for all for good reason. Look, at, at what point did you s not stop focusing on F2, but I mean, really, your title ambitions kind of went out the window when you when you didn't race at Jeddah, right? You need to be in every race to win the title. So flip flopping between F1 and F2 since then, how hard has that been? It's definitely been tough. Um, I probably underestimated how difficult it would be um, just even starting off on weekends where I just do an FP1, um, there's been quite a few of those and you focus on both of them on Thursday, uh, which takes away a little bit of preparation on, on the F2 side of things um, because you really want to impress in an FP1. It's it's the most important session of the weekend um, when you're doing FP1 and, and an F2 weekend. Um, so it's been tough to maximize everything and I often find myself on the back foot a little bit having done free practice ones. But I think in the long run, in the in the big picture, they've been very useful for me, um, not only to learn how the team works and, and get up to speed with the car, but also to show what I'm capable of. Ayo Komatsu, team principal of Haas, has been very impressed. He's even said that those FP1s are more important to him than anything you do in, in F2 this year. Yeah, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> no, because uh, F2 has been, has been tough. Um, not really finding the consistency that I needed or, or wanted. Um, and even just jumping back between the two cars, the driving style is very different and I've been struggling a bit to adapt back to Formula 2. Um, but it's a good thing because I feel really comfortable in F1. Uh, every outing I do, I feel more at home. And, you know, doing a full weekend in, in Baku, minus the FP3 where I, I didn't do any laps, but um, doing a full weekend, fully focusing on one thing and... and getting comfortable uh, was so useful for me. Well, can we talk about Jeddah now? You proved just how comfortable you are in a Formula One car that weekend. But let, let's wind the clock back six months. So it's Thursday. Uh, you put your F2 car, your Prima car on pole position. At what point did you get the call from Ferrari team principal Fred Vasso? Yeah, so I always get this wrong because the weekend was um, shifted a day earlier. So it was Thursday um, and I had done the poll in Formula 2, which was a really unexpected ex unexpected result considering how Bahrain went. Um, we were both really struggling. So we came to, to Jeddah with really low hopes, uh, put the car on pole. And suddenly I was you know, really excited for the weekend, expecting to be fighting for wins. Um, I knew in the background, even on Thursday, that Carlos wasn't feeling 100%. Um, and to get the call on, on Friday was a, was a great feeling. Um, 
I knew that it would be a huge challenge just doing one free practice session and jumping straight in for qualifying um, on a track like Jeddah. The, you know, you have to have massive confidence, get really close to the walls and, and really leave everything out there. But, you know, I'd done about six days in the F1 car before that um, and a couple with Ferrari as well. So at least I knew the procedures and I'd actually done the, the simulator prep um, a few weeks prior not knowing that I would race in Jeddah, but it actually proved really, really helpful. Um, yeah, it was just just insane. So Carlos was struggling on the Thursday in FP1 and FP2. Had Ferrari said, Oli, be ready? Well, before FP1, I was going to, I, I headed over there just to kind of catch up with the guys and, and you know, see how, how everything was going. Um, but, you know, after he drove in FP1 and FP2, I, and I'd done the pole in F2, I was just thinking, okay, it's going to be a normal weekend. Let's uh, let's get back to work on F2 and focus on the important things. Um, and even the next day, you know, it was Saturday morning. Uh, no, Friday morning. See, I told you I get it mixed <laughs> up. Friday morning, I was um, getting ready to start 10th in the sprint race because it's a reverse grid. Um, I was sitting down for lunch when the call came. Only um, at lunchtime. Yeah, but in the, the race, of course, the, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's all a, it's all a delayed, night race. It was still late notice, um, and yeah, I the second the name came up, I, I knew what was gonna be said. Um, it was Fred. Was the was name Fred? Fred. Exactly. Uh, can, can can you remember what he said? What were the words? Well, first of all, he called my manager, but my manager like ran out of credit on his phone or something, <laughs> so he, <laughs> he couldn't take the call. I almost missed the race because my manager didn't top up his uh, his minutes. <laughs> but um, then I called Fred back, like. Like, because I had enough uh, data, thank God. And um, he told me the news. He told me that I would be racing for Ferrari this weekend. And I think he understood pretty quickly that I was getting really nervous from the way I was speaking to him. He was like, Oli, calm down. It's uh, it's going to be okay. Um, I remember telling him that I'll be at the track in like, I'll be in there in 10 minutes, Fred. And uh, my hotel was like half an hour away from the track. <laughs> um, but I didn't want to like miss it, you know, like I, I wanted to get there and, and make sure I could do it. So... Yeah, those like three hours prior to between getting the call and, and get jumping in the car for, for FP3 went by like this. But what, what's the process? I mean, you say you'd driven the Ferrari, but you mean the two year old Ferrari, right? Yeah. So yeah. You had, this was the first time you'd driven the 2024 car. So you need a seat fit and all those things? Well, luckily I'd done that, you know, knowing that I was a, the reserve driver and there was some FP1s in plan and stuff that. Um, were going to happen. Uh, I had a seat already, and, and luckily it's the same as the 2022 car. So I'd driven with it, and I, you know, used it on track before, which is always different to just sitting in it in the factory. Um, so I had all of that ready. I had the pedals length set and stuff, and, and everything. Um, but yeah, the fact that I hadn't driven the car definitely didn't help. But I'd recently done some laps um, in an F1 car. I mean, it's not the F1 car, but it's an F1 car. Um, and I spent those two hours just studying, 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 trying to get up to speed as quickly as possible. Can I, can I ask, studying what? Um, how everything went on Thursday <laughs> um, in, in P1 and P2. So data, I like to watch how the drivers build up because I would be doing the equivalent of an FP1. You know, it was my first laps on the track. So I always like to overlay like the first push, the second push and the third push to see the driver evolution to see where, um, you know, they, they sometimes make mistakes on lap two by overdoing it a little bit. So I like to watch that on data, on onboard. And of course, there are a lot of procedures and stuff that I'd never done before um, that, uh, you know, unique to an F1 weekend that, that I had to learn. Um, and luckily, I had some great people around me guiding me through everything. I mean, you know, to make your debut with Ferrari is a huge opportunity, pressure, were you even aware of the pressure? Did you have time to think of pressure and how people might judge you that weekend? I knew that it was going to be the most important weekend of my life. And actually, just before getting in the car for the race, my manager, he didn't tell me good luck. He didn't say, you know, have fun. He was like, these next two hours are the most important two hours of your life. And I was like, thanks oh, a lot. Thanks for that. I did not yes. need you to tell me that. I knew that already. So... No, I knew it was a, a lot of pressure. The eyes were on me as much as everyone was saying, don't worry, there's no pressure. There's, of course, pressure. Whenever you get in an F1 car, the pressure is high, especially in the circumstances. Um, and I remember that I felt really comfortable with the car pretty early on in FP3. 
So I felt confident and, and comfortable with it. I was happy to push it, which is like the first feeling. If you don't have that, then you're really going to struggle. And that helped me before if, before qualifying. You know, I, I had a good good FP3 lap on the soft tire and I, I felt, you know, I was in the ballpark. I, I would challenge for Q3. I knew that every lap I did would build, you know, that extra one or two percent of confidence and extra 50 percent of experience because, you know, my lap count was doubling every like like so much uh, so quickly. And even my experience in F1 was so low at that point. So every lap was helping. My first soft tire run was much slower than my second one. Um, but my most nervous point on was was on Friday in qualifying um, when I was basically driving down the straight, exiting the last corner, starting my first push lap. And it's just massive nerves. Like, you know, you have the feeling in your stomach like butterflies, like like crazy. But the second I hit the brakes for turn one, gone. And then you're focusing on, on delivering and, and doing the lap. I mean, the lap difference between an F2 car and an F1 car around Jeddah, I think, is 14 seconds. Yeah, I think my first push was 14 seconds I mean, quicker than my I mean, that's a huge difference. I mean, you say, oh, I got into my stride very quickly and I was able to push the car, but... How quickly? I think we started off with like three or four laps on the medium. Um, and by the third or fourth lap, I was I was pretty confident. Um, you know, I'd already got close to the walls in the F2 car. So I knew that they weren't forgiving. And I knew <laughs> the lines and the approach, the, the different, you know, how you approach some corners. Um, you know, a lo lot of chicanes there where you have to sacrifice one corner to be better in the other one and, and stuff like that. So I knew all of that stuff. Um, and generally the F1 car, I, I tend to feel a bit more comfortable in it. Um, and especially on a street track where you have to feel comfortable, it came really quickly. What, what is it about the F1 car in terms of driving style? It's just that the, I mean, first of all, we have a lot more downforce, which always makes your life a bit easier. Um, but just the entry phase of the F1 car, basically from straight line to the apex, is something I struggle with a bit in F2, but in F1, it, it comes to me a bit more naturally. Plus you have a lot more toys to play with, um, which just make your life much easier. You can really manipulate how the car reacts. And I like that. And I seem to, to get on well with it. So as well as getting used to the 14 second a lap time difference, um, you were happy with all of the different systems on the steering wheel and on the car, and you were able to maximize that side of it? Happy is a strong word. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, the, I've done a lot of days on the simulator and I continue to do that because it's uh, super helpful for me, but also for the team. And, you know, the fact that I knew the steering wheel um, was was so helpful because if I went into FB3, also having to learn how the steering wheel works, that would have been a, you know, a steep, uh, steep challenge. But, uh, you know, having the, the fact that I knew the steering wheel, okay, I hadn't changed any settings on it between the walls um, and I still had to get, you know, they were still telling me what to do pretty much. Uh, but that really helped me, the fact that I had the sim experience. And a very handy teammate in Charles Leclerc. Uh, was, yeah. was he helpful? Did he give you any advice? What did you learn from him? I mean, not much in the way of advice. Any advice he gave me was, I mean, seemingly little to him. He was giving me a bit of help about the tires in, in the consecutive laps before the race. But, you know, for him, it was a tiny bit of advice. For me, it was like game changing because I was very low in experience and I needed every bit of help I could get. And he was really open. Um, I mean, he's just a great guy, you know, so it, it makes sense. And, um, but, you know, just having him to compare to, especially in qualifying, you know, that I, I would say he's the best qualifier, um, especially at the moment, you know, that he's going to get it right. So just try and copy what he's doing. Um, that was my goal. So first crack, what was it? Half a second off show in, in Q2? I don't remember, but I do Happy remember that, that I didn't make it to Q3. That's that's yeah. the <laughs> Well, but you so nearly knocked yeah. Lewis Hamilton out. It was tiny margin between you and Lewis. Yeah, I did a mistake in, in turn 22. Um, really fast left-hander and I just ran wide on exit. Um, and then I had to do, th there's, I had to do my lap on my second lap and the tires aren't as good on the second lap. So, if I just not made that mistake on lap one, I would have made it to Q3 pretty easily. Um, and so, knocked out a seven-time world champion. <laughs> well, you never know. Maybe it would have changed. But <laughs> yeah, that, that would have been it. Um, and it was so tight. So I, I was a bit disappointed. 
Um, but you know, I, I had to make huge steps lap on lap because the track is evolving like crazy in qualifying. And I remember that qualifying, I just had no idea what was going on. Like I would do the lap, I would come into the pits, no idea what session we were in. Like <laughs> I would literally just, I, I had no clue what was happening. Like Because what, so the focused The turnaround on... times were so fast and I just wasn't ready for it. Like it, it was so funny. Like I did the first lap and then I was like, okay, so what do we do now? Like I've completely forgot the plan because so much stuff is happening. Um, it was just such a whirlwind. And you know, the flag comes down on Q2 and I'm, I'm out and suddenly I'm like, Damn it, I just missed it. But it was just so fast, I, I just couldn't keep up. There's something powerful about slipping into a great suit. It's like stepping into a new level of confidence. For me, nothing beats that feeling, and Indochino takes it to the next level with their custom men's and women's wear. With fall here and events like weddings and parties popping up, it's the perfect time for a refresh. You should definitely check out Indochino's fall winter collection. They've got a stunning selection of made-to-measure suits, dress shirts, and blazers crafted from luxurious fabrics in a variety of gorgeous autumnal tones that are sure to make you feel like the best-dressed person in the room. And listeners of the show can check out the collection and get 10% off orders of $399 or more when they use the code GRID at Indochino.com. I've ordered custom menswear from Indochino, and the process was seamless. Whether you shop online or visit a showroom, the customization options are endless. You can tweak everything from the lapels to the lining, the collars and the cuffs. When my order arrived, it felt great and fitted perfectly. It really opened my eyes to the quality you can expect, even if you've never ordered tailored items online before. So don't be afraid to step out of your comfort zone. This fall, update your wardrobe to quintessential suiting elements with contemporary flair from Indochino. Visit Indochino.com and use the code GRID to get 10% off any purchase of $399 or more. That's 10% off at Indochino, I-N-D-O-C-H-I-N-O.com, promo code GRID. What were 50 laps of Jeddah like? Both... both Mentally and physically. Painful. <laughs> really painful. <laughs> Can I say, Oli, if you look at the in-car footage towards the end, tell me if I'm wrong, but your head does seem to be bouncing around quite a lot. Had the neck gone by the end? Oh, it was, it was, it didn't exist. I, I didn't have <laughs> like any neck for like, yeah, exactly. For like two days after the race, I, I couldn't use it. I was like, uh, I was in a cast basically. It was so stiff. Um, yeah, it was, I, I knew after qualifying, after lap one in qualifying, I was like, damn, I have to do 50 of those tomorrow. And uh, one is tough. So, you know, Jeddah is one of the most difficult tracks on the calendar. Um, and it was such a challenge because, first of all, you get really hot. Um, the humidity was high. And the heat is, is quite a bit higher in F1 than it is in F2, as in within the cockpit. Uh, everything is more tightly packed. And, you know, it's quite hot in there. And, yeah, the neck was just destroyed, completely destroyed. I had a headache from how hard I was hitting the, the headrest during the race. Um, but mentally, but your lap times were still consistent. That was the amazing yeah, thing. Yeah, actually, it didn't really affect my lap times because I had these huge, um, I won't say what we call them in, in like within the team, but we have these huge pads um, on the on the um, Just to help hold the head, the rest, head in Basically place. stopping yeah. the head from, because if you turn and your head goes like this, you lose completely the feeling of the car. Um, but my head was able to stay level, um, which made me, you know, I could still see the corner, um, but it didn't look pretty, that's for sure. <laughs> Look, what you finished P7. What what did Fred Vasseur say to you after the race? Before the race, he told me because in, F, in qualifying, I hit the wall a few times, just gently, but enough to to leave a mark on the on the side wall of the tire. Um, so after after quali, he told me can't do that anymore, like no more of that. Um, and after the race, he was of course happy. Um, we didn't catch up massively, but um, I knew he would be happy because I did a clean race. That was really the goal of the race, to, to have a good start, clean pit stop, follow the procedures correctly, and uh, bring the car back with four corners still attached, which uh, is no mean feat in, in Jeddah. You did all of that. I mean, w was there ever a discussion of, of you racing for the team again in Australia? Because of course, Carlos had had his appendicitis. We didn't know how quickly he was going to be back in the car. W what did the team tell you? It was never a discussion. Um, I was of course ready ag again um in australia but i was glad to see carlos back and you know that was a great race for him he took the victory and he was flying all weekend so uh, maybe the weight reduction helped him a little bit <laughs> was there a little bit of you thinking oh if i was in that car now 
Yeah, of course I was hoping um, to do a full weekend because mm. starting from FP3 put me on the back foot, that's for sure. And I think doing two weekends in a row is so useful because you can build on your experience from the previous weekend. And it's not something I've had the pleasure of doing yet. So yeah, I, I was of course hoping for that. Um, I, I would be lying if I said I didn't, but I was pretty sure that, that you know, Carlos is a, is a strong guy um, and dedicated as well. So I knew he'd be back. And uh, I was really happy for him. Look, w once you've raced in Formula One and Ferrari, for that matter, how hard is it mentally to then go back to F2? I knew that like targets were on me. That was for sure. Um, targets, was, as as in you the think other drivers were, were focusing yeah. on me a little we'll bit. We'll show this F1 guy exactly. Um, but no, it, it was. I mean, Melbourne. I jumped straight back in the car and it was going well. I just had an engine failure in quali, so. That was a bit tough, but, you know, straight away I was able to, to jump back in the car and, and be competitive. Um, but it was tough, you know, to, to get in F1, to be up there with, with the huge names that you've been watching as a kid. Going back to F2 is tough, but also it was even more motivating because um, I wanted to, to get back in F1. Well, how quickly after Jeddah did talk of 2025 start? Talk of 2025 was always on the cards. I think Jeddah accelerated that quite a lot. You know, I already had six FP1s in the books with Haas um, before before the season even started. So, you know, we knew that was an option and, and one that we were pushing for heavily. And Jeddah definitely accelerated that. I was focusing on driving F2 and, and my F1 outings. Um, but my manager, I'm sure, was was pushing really hard. So can you describe the moment when you were told that you got the Haas seat for 25? Where were you? What were you doing? What was said? Well, in F1, I think until you really put the pen on the paper and sign the contract that, that seals the deal for, for your future, nothing is, is certain because there were talks about it and it was, you know, a lot of people were saying it was the worst kept secret in, in history and stuff like this. But actually for me, I, I had no idea um, I knew that, that we were in discussion, but I had no idea that it was official until maybe three days um, before it was announced when I signed the paper. And actually, I was with my, at my manager's house, who lives quite close to Silverstone. Um, we were having a barbecue and uh, he finally got the confirmation that the last little bits had been sorted and, and that it was confirmed. Um, and it was really special to share that moment with him because he's been with me since my first year in cars in 2020. And it's been a journey for us. Um, and he's the type of guy that's always there through thick and thin. So um, it was really special. But did Io ring you? Did Fred no. ring you? No. Or was it all done through? Can we give the man? Well, who is your manager? My manager is Chris Harfield. And um, hmm. yeah, I give him all the credits. Um, no, I didn't get a call from, from, from any of the, the team principals. But, um, you know, I caught up with them pretty much the next day. Um, actually, with I was the same day in the, in the Haas factory. So it was really nice to shake hands and, and talk to him after it had been confirmed. Um, because before, you're kind of treading on thin ice a little bit, you know? Well, there was a huge fuss made at Silverstone about you signing. Uh, you know, it's the British Grand Prix, another Brit on the grid. Um, were you surprised just what big news it was? Um, you know, we plan for it to be at the British Grand Prix, uh, yeah. of course, with, with everything, it, it makes a lot of sense. And it was probably the best weekend, um, in terms of off track and support and stuff that I've had. It was fantastic to see how much everyone was supporting me and, and, uh, you know, rooting for me. And no, I didn't expect it to be as big as it was. Um, but you know, the, the British crowd, uh, always really impressive and, uh, always there to surprise you. I mean, Oli. What's it like to achieve your life goal, your life ambition, right? From when, what were you, age 16, you left home, you went to live in Italy. This has been the goal ever since then, right? Yeah, but even, you know, I think around that age, it turned of, it, it turned less, it, it became, didn't become, a, it wasn't a dream. It became, you know, a dream with some possibility. It was a dream from when I was five, six years old. But when I was 15, 16, becoming part of the academy, it wasn't a dream anymore because it was in touching distance. I knew that I, if I performed and if I did what I needed to, I could actually get there. Um, 
when I was five six, I said I wanted to be an F one, and everyone was like, "Yeah, good good luck." Um, mm. But yeah, it, it's it's been a lot of hard work and, and sacrifice, not only from me but also from my family, um, who have had to you know give up a lot of time, um, especially. And you know, it's it's tough for a family to support a ch uh, their kid from karting all the way to to F two, and um, yeah, I'm very happy that that it's paid off and that I've achieved the dream of getting to F1, but my dream is not just to get to F1, I want to have longevity in F1 and, and stay here for as long as possible. Oli, just t tell us about life in Italy as a teenager. Where did you move to Modena, is that right? I started in, in Maranello, which is uh, exactly where Ferrari is. Then I moved to Modena, a bit more in the city, um, a bit more going on. And I, I like it there, I've made some friends and I really enjoy it. Um, you know, we have a lot of people from the academy living there and we spend a lot of time together, which is really nice. So you were mixing primarily with other racing drivers? Yes, mostly. Um, but now, as I've grown up a bit, I, I you know, friends with some of the engineers at Ferrari, at Haas. Um, so it's cool, I, I really enjoy life there. At, at the start, it was tough, really tough. Can you speak Italian? I can speak Italian a little bit. Um, I wouldn't say I'm I'm fluent, but I'm on my way. Um, I can I can speak the Italian that I need to, which is ordering a pizza and uh, and and stuff like that. So I can speak the, the Italian that I need. Look, and, and did mom and dad, David and Terry, did they come out? Were they spending a lot of time with you in Italy, or were you very much on your own out there? I was pretty alone. Um, I remember in my first year of F3, it was tough and every weekend I could, I would go back to the UK, spend as much time there as possible. I miss my family, I miss my friends, I miss my dogs. <laughs> and um, yeah, but you know, as time goes on, I, I got my car there. Um, well, we, we drove it from the UK um, out to Italy once I turned 18. And uh, then I gained a bit of freedom. I, I found some more friends and, and now I don't really go back to the UK. Um, I quite enjoy life in Europe. What car do you drive? I have a, well, I had a BMW 1 Series, um, okay. but I shouldn't say that because it's not a Ferrari, but um, sure. it was an English car. So driving on the, on the right hand side, um, which was a pain for the, for the telepass and stuff like this. I always had to lean across <laughs> to the other side to, to get my toll, but now I have a Alfa Romeo company car. So yeah, of course. it's on the right side, the correct side. Um, yeah. It's a bit easier now. I'm re I remember there was a press conference. We've been talking about Carlos Sainz and I think all His the drivers golf. in the press conference were asked what cars they were driving it. And, and it was sort of back in the days of sort of, I remember Marcus Ericsson saying some fancy car and there was Ferraris being mentioned and all sorts. And Carlos said, Golf GTI. <laughs> he had a GTI. Yeah, I think it was, it's impressive. I think it was, but you know, he was just didn't, you know. <laughs> I think he still has that car. Does he still have that I car? think so. I've seen it on a YouTube video somewhere. <laughs> Look, let's, let's wind it forward to Baku where you had a lot more notice, which was a good thing, wasn't it? Yeah, thank God. I had a, I had a week rather than an hour, which, was a, which is nice. Uh, and did you feel more pressure, less pressure than you did in Jeddah? Less pressure because I was more ready. I knew that I was ready for this. Um, and if you're ready, there's no reason to feel pressure. I think pressure comes when you are underprepared or haven't, um, like, not worked hard enough, but, you know, you're not ready. And I, I felt ready, so I, I didn't really feel any pressure. And I was actually really excited at the prospect of doing a full weekend from FP1 and my first time doing FP2. I remember you being <laughs> excited about that. Yeah, yeah. it was amazing. It was <laughs> such a good session. Um, and you did have a really good session. Yeah, well, yeah. it went well as well, yeah. actually. So, no, it's it's just great to see how a weekend pans out, you know, how the track evolves through a weekend um, and how you can build confidence in the car. And, yeah, maybe I did that a bit too fast because well, FP3 well, oh, <laughs> was so, a bit sorry. short. You, you, you know, you, you have... Um, the crash in FP3, so you don't really do any laps at all in that session. How much did that compromise you going into qualifying? I would say it was the, I mean, a big factor as to why I missed out on Q3, um, just because the what I did was I made a mistake in, Q, in Q2 on my final lap, and that ultimately stopped me from advancing. And I feel like if I'd done the laps in FP3, I would have already done this mistake um, or already build the confidence in, in a better way. Um, whereas, you know, I'd only done two laps on, on the soft tire um, before qualifying started. So every lap I was doing was a bit of a shot in the dark. And um, 
of course my confidence got knocked a little bit um, after what happened. You qualify 11th, which is actually where you qualified in Jeddah. Uh, which was the better lap? The quali lap in Jeddah or the quali lap in Baku? Honestly, the quali lap in Baku, except from two corners where I lost four tenths compared to myself on a used tire, so so much time, was really, really good. I was really happy with it. I was in the rhythm, in the flow, and I, I felt like this was the lap. And then I did this mistake and that really hurt. Um, but I think, yeah, both of the laps were like 90% good and just that one mistake that, that stopped me from, from advancing in both of the laps. So they're both, they were both uh, just missing out. But c can you give us some insight into the two cars, right? Everyone says that, you know, the grid is, is much closer together this year. Just w what are the fundamental differences between the Ferrari and the Haas? Honestly, fundamentally, I don't feel much between the cars, which is a great feeling because I gain confidence pretty much instantly in the Ferrari and it was the same story with the Haas. Last year in the Haas, I lacked a bit more confidence in the car. It was a bit more unpredictable, but they've made a great step this year and the car is really predictable and, and really um, on the limit. It, it's You can play with it a bit more than you could last year. Um, so if I compare last year's Haas to this year's Haas, it's been a, a big step forward. And also that's reflected in, in the results. Um, but if I'm comparing the Ferrari and the Haas, the main difference is really the color. Um, <laughs> apart from that, there's really not much in it. Okay, interesting. Uh, were you treating Baku a bit like the first race of 2025? Exactly. That's what I... Did you have the same engineers that you'll be working with next year? It's not confirmed yet because, uh, you know, we're still working on, on everything. Uh, it's still pretty early days on, on that side of things, but I really love the team that I worked with. Um, we got along really, really well and it went really smoothly. They, they guided me through everything really well, really efficiently. And exactly, this race was like a dry run for next year. Um, well, you were with Mark Slade, weren't you? Yeah. I mean, that man has more experience than almost any other race engineer I can think of. Exactly. What is it? Mick Hakkinen, Kimi Raikkonen, Fernando Alonso. He's worked, he's worked with all of them. He's got some great stories about uh, Kimi, especially, um, <laughs> which, which I was really, you know, privileged to hear. And, you know, I made up for my lack of experience for, by having Mark um, with his wealth of experience. And uh, he was really invaluable for, uh, to me. This how, how much was he talking to you during the race? Because I felt you were quite hard on yourself after the race when you were saying that you were perhaps being um, a little conservative in the first stint. But w what was Mark saying to you at the time? Was he, in, was he saying that I think there's more time in this or was he leaving it to you to judge? I, I think, you know, with, with the drivers that they've had with so much experience, they don't really need to guide them, but I needed that a little bit more. Um, so a bit of ad adaptation was needed um, between us. And this was really what that weekend was about, you know, preparing what I like, what I don't like, what he likes, what he doesn't like, and what the other engineers on, on my side of the garage, you know, work well with, don't work well with. And that's really what this weekend was about. And um, yeah, I... I I would have liked a bit more, um, but when I asked for it, I got it. So it was just a case of asking. Um, and yeah, I was just a bit conservative on the first stint. Um, FP2 went really well and I was saving the tires quite a lot and I had a really good long run. So I kind of took the same approach into the race, but with the track evolution and, and stuff, the tires were really durable in the race comparing to FP2. So I'll put that one down to experience. Just what with more as the, the track had rubbered in and, and it was just yeah, a better graining, condition. Graining was a bit of a issue on Friday. Right. especially with the rear yeah. um, for us. And that's a race killer, you know, once once you get a bit of rear graining, you can't really do anything about it. And um, that was what we struggled with on Friday. So we were taking steps against that um, and I was taking steps against that on my driving, but it wasn't an issue at all for us on Sunday. Um, but I was still taking steps against it for oh, no that's, reason. That's what, that's what learning's all about. And you were still, God, you were so opportunistic at the end then. Yeah, you have to be, right? That's uh that's what it's about. You know, you the yeah. the battle for points is so tight um that you have to be perfect. And I made up for being far from perfect on the first in by grabbing that last position at the end. Um so I kind of made up for it. One of my favorite memories has to be cycling up Alpe d'Huez, that infamous stage of the Tour de France on a hot August day. The scenery was majestic and the sense of satisfaction when I got to the top was euphoric. 
But if there's one thing I learned that day, it's that staying hydrated and energised was key to making it to the summit. And that's where Liquid IV Hydration Multiplier Plus Energy comes in. It's got 100 milligrams of natural caffeine, about as much as one to two cups of coffee, and three times the electrolytes of a leading sports drink, so you feel refreshed and ready to keep going. They've even combined their fan favourite peach flavour with the highly requested blackberry, which is not to be skipped. But you don't need to be out cycling to enjoy the benefits of Liquid IV. It's perfect for travelling or simply getting you through the dreaded afternoon slump on a busy day. Just tear open a stick, pour it into 16 ounces of water, and you're sorted. It hydrates faster than water alone and will give you that much-needed extra boost of energy. Plus, it's non-GMO, vegan and free of gluten, dairy and soy, so it's as clean as it is powerful. Tear, pour, live more with Liquid IV Hydration Multiplier Plus Energy. Take on the great outdoors with Liquid IV. Get 20% off your first order of Liquid IV when you go to liquidiv.com and use the code GRID at checkout. That's 20% off your first order when you shop better hydration today using the promo code GRID at liquidiv.com. Tell us about Nico Hulkenberg. I mean, you've had two very handy teammates in your two races so far. Charles Leclerc race one, Nico Hulkenberg race two. I mean, um, Jolien Palmer was on the pod the other day and he, he called Nico Hulkenberg the career killer. That's how he described him because <laughs> he's so fast. Yeah, he's quick. He's definitely quick. He gets up to speed impressively fast. And I love the way he works with the engineers, his feedback, the way he articulates what he feels because we all feel the same thing, right? But when I'm listening to him talk about what he feels in the car, I can also make, like, I can also, I, I say, okay, I, I felt that, but I wouldn't have been able to explain it. So he kind of puts things into perspective. Um, so he's a great help for the engineers. And also, you know, looking at his data and, and the way he drives has also been really, really helpful. And he was really open to me as well this weekend. So yeah. it's been nice. Well, let's throw it forward to 25. You're, you're in the Haas. You've got Esteban Ocon as your teammate. Um, are you going to maintain links with Maranello? Are you going to be hanging out with Lewis Hamilton in, in Maranello? <laughs> well, let's see. Um, I think he's a bit busier than I am. So, no, first of all, it's great to see that Lewis will be racing for Ferrari next year. It's, um, you know, the dream pairing, the best team, the best driver. So it's uh i'm really excited to see how it goes um and of course i'll continue as a as a reserve driver i don't think i'll live in italy anymore but um that's okay i'll still keep working on my italian um and spend as much time in, in maranello as as possible um but yeah i'm really excited to see what next year holds it's going to be great there's a wonderful photograph uh, of part Ferme in baku where you and you and lewis are sort of shaking hands and and I mean, you had a good scrap with him in Baku. Did, is it a bit surreal for you to race Lewis Hamilton? I mean, if I was to say to you, who are your heroes? Is he one of them? Um, I, I tend to think of Michael Schumacher when, you know, that's my connotation with the word heroes. Um, but people like Lewis, Jensen and Vettel, these are people that I watched at the front of the F1 grid in 2011, 12, 13, when I was growing up. Those were the races I watched as a kid. So um, if you if you guys have don't know how old I am, that's that's about my age. Um, <laughs> you were two <laughs> when Lewis made his Formula One debut. Exactly, yeah. So, yeah, I'm a bit young. Um, so I, I didn't get to watch um, Michael live, really. You know, I, he raced in 2011, but honestly, I, I don't recall. Um, but just the way people talk about him in Ferrari um makes me yeah i don't know really admire him but also these three were lewis jensen and seb these were three people that i really loved as well um and to get the chance to share the track with lewis is special ollie you're 19 years old and when you get to formula one you become more than just a racing driver you are suddenly the focal point for a team even at Haas, of 800 people you talking about Michael Schumacher makes me think of this and that he was so uh, inspirational for the whole team. And so suddenly, age 19, you're going to be almost you're leading a Formula One team. Yeah, it's, uh, it's an interesting thing. How, you know, how do you prepare for that? You go from F2 with about 15 staff to 
just your side of the table having 15 staff and the other 15 are there and the other 600 are back in, in Banbury. So, yeah, first of all, I have to remember a lot of names. That's uh, that's my next task. That's my winter um, revision. We'll be remembering everyone's names. Um, but what, what but kind no, of personality are you, Oli? Are, are you a natural leader, do you think? I, I think so. I think so. I mean, I, I, yeah, I like to be um, someone who people can depend on and, and I like to try and motivate the team as much as possible. Um, across the weekend, you know, they, I, I gave them a big task of fixing my car between FP3 and Quali, um, but they were all happy to do so and I, I managed to bring a decent result at the end of it. Um, so I feel like also having a new face in the team is a good motivation um, and I really want to carry that forward because the team's motivation is so high anyway and coming to the team, I think, you know, a fresh face can, can really help that. So I'm going to do my best to um, be really close to them and, and really rally with them because it's super important. Do you, do you think the team knows that you're actually an influencer? Influencer? Like, yeah, uh, I think so. On Instagram? <laughs> <laughs> Definitely no, but also, not. <laughs> the bare necessities. Um, what is it? You've got your own yeah. YouTube channel. Yeah, it's... Uh, I did have a quick look before we, we got together. Any good? What do you, what do you think? Oh, I, mate, influencer. That's what I think you are. <laughs> yeah. There, yeah. Was a lot of, there was a lot of food. Yeah, I'm Are a you a massive foodie? I like food. I don't cook it very well. I don't know if you saw, but <laughs> I eat very well. <laughs> um, probably too well, considering my. Are my you going to keep? Are you going to keep doing the YouTube channel? I'm going to try my best. It's been a while. We need to dust off the the camera. Um, we haven't done an episode for a while, but it's tough to think of new ideas um, because I I want to like show my normal side um, because at the end I'm just a normal person away from the racetrack I, I do normal things so that's what I've been trying to do and, and you know show a bit more personal side um, but now I'm running out of ideas what to do oh, so. I just have the cameras follow you in Formula 1 that that's that that also works but there's yeah. a lot of those already in F1 there's about oh, 100 okay. cameras so we're thinking of stuff but it's nice to you know stay in touch with the fans and, and give them what they like because it seems that they've really been enjoying that now so. I, I get what you've done with the bare necessities right I, I get that how the good, name right? came about but I t but are you a, a fan of the Jungle Book Blue Mowgli but I think it's like older than me if I if I'm what? correct the Jungle Book it, it yeah and uh, I haven't read it no but I, I know so you song. haven't had kids if you have kids you spend a lot of time with the Jungle Book I I've got a couple you. years until, yeah. until that <laughs> so yeah and uh, look just final thing racing is obviously a huge part of your family I mean you've got the cuts to your dad in Jeddah in particular stood at the back of the Ferrari garage looking incredibly I think at one point John Elkin comes and puts his arm around him or doesn't he? yeah <laughs> bit of support. dad looked really nervous dad David yeah. but also you've got a brother is it Tom who's karting as well yeah actually he's moving into F4 as we speak so okay. he's going to be racing in British F4 he's he's starting out um so hopefully he can follow in the footsteps and I'll give him as much support as, as I can. Um, but also you want the process to be natural and let them learn and do their mistakes because if you don't really do those mistakes, then you, you don't learn. Um, so you have to be a bit careful with, with that. Um, is Tom moving to Italy and doing this sort of, is he no, same path? No, he's going to be racing in the UK because okay, okay. he still has to do his GCSEs. I was lucky that with COVID, I could do my GCSEs um, from the beach in, uh, <laughs> in Italy. So I was very lucky. Um, so with no, COVID, dad, did you actually have to sit the exams? No, it was all done on I, I did mocks, yeah. I yeah. did them off of mocks, which I did um, on Zoom. So And I'm sure you did very, very legitimately well. Legitimately, yeah. very well. <laughs> <laughs> so lucky. Yeah. <laughs> no, okay. but um, yeah, my dad, I, I want to get back to that. He, he, first of all, when I watch my brother or my sister, she does some, uh, some sport as well. I get so nervous. So I can't imagine what it's like to be my dad who watches all of us every weekend and uh i think I, i've got a gif of him like in the in the garage and i From always Jeddah, right i always send it to him <laughs> <laughs> it's like this one where he's i think it's where i get really close to the wall but ollie if there's one person who you couldn't have done this without who is it there's not just one person okay um I mean, I, I would say my dad, but it's my whole family, you know, because my dad was the one who took me um, to, to all the events and also funded them um, and, and worked very, very hard to do so. But 
he was away from my other siblings on those weekends and weekends that he didn't make it or weekends that he had to work it was my mom who took me and if my mom was busy my granddad took me so it's not just my immediate family but also my extended family who had to take huge commitments and, and make big sacrifices to make all of this possible um but when i look back i think about how many people have helped me from my first karting mechanic my first driver coach um my second driver coach was billy munger who who we see in the paddock quite a lot as well so how, how closely did you work with billy very closely he was um when he was around 17 i remember because he was just driving his road car um and he was my driver coach he was racing in f4 at the time and he was driver coaching me um he likes to tell me that i'm only here thanks to him and, and of course so, i fully agree sort of thing eddie jordan used to say to his driver <laughs> exactly i made you yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah so he's very yeah, proud of that yeah. he's gonna take a cut of, of <laughs> any money i ever make um but no there's there's been so many people um yeah so many karting teams that I've worked with and, and you know, all the teams I race with on the way up, Prema, Van Amersfoort Racing, US Racing, um, Fortech as well in, in the UK. There's just so many faces. Um, I couldn't fill a room with them, you know, I would have to have a, there's so many people. Um, so it's not just one person, it's, it's a massive journey. Well, Oli, you're embarking on a very exciting journey. Good luck with it all. Um, now, can I just end this episode in what I call the traditional way, some quick fire questions. Yeah. What else are you good at? Oh, great question. Um, I'm getting good at cycling. Cycling is something that I've um, recently taken up and it's very good training for, for F1. Um, and I'm getting pretty, pretty good at it. Paddle is something that I would like to say I'm good at, but I'm not yet. So I'm still working on that. Um, so it's only other sports, really. Are, are you a kit man? Because I always think if you, most of the cyclists I know have got kit, lots of kit. Yeah, I do. I do. Yeah. I don't take any photos of it. though. <laughs> it's not the most beautiful. <laughs> you know, Valtteri Bottas is about to enter the gravel world championships in Belgium. Yes, I saw. And he, he did a gravel race in, in the US as well. Yeah, think, yeah, yeah. He's, he's, he's mad for he's it. He's so very fast. If you want to give yourself a challenge go out with Valtteri try on and bike. follow him yeah, exactly. stay in the yeah, exactly. try try yeah. and um, now look which racing person dead or alive would you like to be stuck in a lift with you know I would really like to meet Sebastian Vettel like fully because I I I really like his personality. I think he's a great guy and really charismatic and, and has a lot going for him. Um, and when I did the race in, in um, Jeddah, he was like one of the first people to message me as well. Um, and I was with his engineer from when he was in Ferrari who spoke very highly of him. So yeah, I would like to, you know, I've shook his hand and said hello, but never really spoken to him. So um, yeah, I would like to, I mean, I wouldn't like to get stuck in a lift. I'd just speak to him but um yeah if i didn't have a choice over him now, this is specifically in a lift but but he's a smart guy he'll help mend the lift right? yeah exactly he'll yeah. fix the lift so we'll be good <laughs> all right who who would play you in a film i'm not at that level yet no one's going to be playing me in a film i'm not 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 uh good enough but um probably someone who looks like me i don't know oh, who looks like you i have no idea like i don't know any actors i'm i'm really bad at that so i have to come back to you on that one all right well that's one for another day um who is the coolest person in your contacts in my contacts um well, i guess one of the f1 drivers i assume i don't have yeah that's all well, i got who, who's the coolest f1 who's the driver? coolest f1 driver that's uh that's a tough question i think um I really think Charles is, is like really cool, like the way he dresses, the way he, I don't know, like he always looks cool. That's uh, <laughs> and Lewis as well. He's he uh, he's always got interesting outfits, and and that's really Wait, cool as well. You said earlier you like your dogs. There's Leo, the Dachshund. There's Roscoe, the what is Roscoe? He's a, is he a pug? bulldog. No, no, no. I think he's a bulldog. Isn't I, he? I'm not sure. I've got uh, some dogs as well, but I'm not the dad. I'm the brother of the dogs okay <laughs> the so they're not going to be coming to the paddock <laughs> well maybe i'll think about it but my dogs i've got a really big dog that okay. i can't really pick up and okay. uh maybe the little one ruby would be would okay. be good um right. yeah i'll think about it for silverstone all right look, last one um if you had a podcast like this who would be your first guest my first guest um tom clarkson <laughs> <laughs> no i have no idea 
Um, I would probably take someone funny, um, like a comedian. Who? Who, who um, makes you laugh? You know, I really like the film Dumb and Dumber. <laughs> I think Jim Carrey would make me laugh on a, on a podcast. He's crazy. It would be a good, it would be a good one. It would I'd listen to that. For sure. I yeah. think it would be an interesting yeah, one. Yeah, it would. All right. Ollie, great to have you on. Thank you so much. Best of luck with everything. Thank you very much.